amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Um, with the words of that famous hymn, John Newton captured perfectly the experience of countless <coughs> believers across the ages and around the world today. He himself was a recipient of amazing grace and in these words he gave a voice to millions of us. It's said that a group of British scholars were once discussing what made Christianity stand out from other religions. That's easy, said C.S. Lewis coming into the room. It's grace. Now, I can't actually vouch for that story. I've never come across it in any of C.S. Lewis's books, but the point of the anecdote is true regardless. Most religions are about things that we have to do, whether it's doing good works, almsgiving, achieving a mystical state, or whatever, in order to reach enlightenment or earn our salvation. But biblical Christianity rests on what has already been done, the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, which we can only receive by faith. In fact, we can never earn our way into God's good books, but he's freely given all that we need if we're willing to humble ourselves and receive from him. And that's the, the essence of grace. It's being freely given what we don't deserve. The old acronym is God's Riches at Christ's Expense. It's, it's a wonderful reality to experience the kindness of God who's done what we could never do. The God who receives the unworthy and pays all our debts at immeasurable cost. And that's the reality at the heart of this morning's story. I want to speak this morning about one of the most beautiful stories in the Gospel. A story that shows the wonderful depths of God's grace and highlights the joy and the tragedy of two very different responses to that grace. Here we see the depth of God's mercy, that we are all sinners who need to repent. And we see that humility and love are the true response to grace and forgiveness and lastly we're pointed to Jesus as the one who alone is able to forgive sinners so I want to look at the, this passage this morning under three headings firstly a disgraceful visitor secondly an ungracious host and lastly a grace-filled saviour so firstly a disgraceful visitor. We're going to we, we dive into this story of scandalous grace as a, as a sinful woman anoints Jesus' feet. It's, it's worth noting at the outset that this is a different occasion from the similar incident when Mary of Bethany anointed Jesus in the week before his death, as recorded later in the other Gospels. If you read carefully, the details and the circumstances are quite different. Here Jesus is invited by Simon, a respectable Pharisee, to have dinner with him and some other guests. Maybe he was motivated by genuine curiosity about this new teacher who the people were acclaiming as a great prophet. Or maybe he was looking for an opportunity to find things against him, like many other Pharisees. Um, even in the, the two verses before this story, um, we're told that people were saying, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So maybe Simon was, was looking for an opportunity to find things against him, like the other Pharisees. And if so, he was soon presented with an opportunity. A woman who had lived a sinful life, perhaps a prostitute, um, learned that Jesus was eating at Simon's house and came along 
with a jar of ointment to anoint him. Traditionally, the, the Roman Catholic Church has associated this woman with Mary Magdalene, but there's, a, there's no evidence to support this other than the fact that Mary Magdalene is first referred to after this story in chapter 8, verse 2, among other women who travelled with Jesus and his disciples and helped to support their ministry. So as an aside, this story does show the importance of women in Jesus' life and ministry. It wasn't all about the male disciples by any means. But back to the story, culturally, this would have been an open social meal where servants and others could come and go. Yet even then, a woman who was known as a sinner would have been a very unwelcome guest in Simon's house. Yet here was a woman who had been deep, touched at the deepest level by Jesus' message of God's love for sinners such as herself. She was overwhelmed by remorse for her own sin and gratitude for the love and forgiveness that she'd received. No wonder she stood behind Jesus, weeping at his feet. Again, uh, we need to understand that in that culture, Jesus would have been reclining at the table, leaning on his left arm, with his legs stretched out beside him. And as this woman stood there weeping, she wet his feet with her tears. Um, and let's be clear, she's not just standing there silently weeping. She's making quite a scene. The, the Greek word uses kleuza, which means she was lamenting. And um, again, it uses the word brekine, which means that her tears were raining down, showering down. You can imagine how uneasy Simon the Pharisee would feel about this unwanted intrusion. And then shockingly, she let her hair down, something which Jewish women never did in public, and used it to wipe his feet, kissing them and pouring perfume on them. Of course, to attend to someone's feet was anyway a menial task assigned to a slave, a real sign of humility. Beside that, this woman would have, to, would have had to endure many disapproving looks. But it seems she did not care. And the perfume she poured out was a real sign of love and gratitude in response to forgiveness. Her devotion put so much of our half-hearted worship to shame. But what an extraordinary scene. Just imagine the scandal and social embarrassment it would cause. No wonder Simon was taken aback. Um, I'm, I'm picturing Hyacinth Bouquet in Keeping Up Appearances hosting a tea party for the local vicar and her disreputable brother-in-law Onslow turning up. <laughs> this is a social disaster. And yet Jesus appears to fully accept this woman. Simon is embarrassed and scandalised. If this man were truly a prophet, he thinks, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman that she is, that she is a sinner. But as we'll see, Jesus' answer showed that he was indeed a prophet and more than a prophet. Not only did he know what Simon was thinking and all about the woman, but he knew who Simon was and what kind of man he was. So secondly, we see an ungracious host. Simon, Jesus said, I have something to tell you. Two men owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. A denarius, by the way, was about a day's wages. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he cancelled the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? As Simon grudgingly recognised, the answer was obvious. I suppose the one who had the bigger debt cancelled. 
No doubt he recognised he was falling into a trap. But Jesus goes on to press home the point by contrasting the cold reception he's been given by Simon with that the woman had given him. Simon has failed to extend even the basic courtesies to Jesus, yet the woman has shown him extravagant devotion. And that love, referring back to the parable, is the proof that her many sins have been forgiven. Her love is not the cause of her forgiveness, but the response to it. By contrast, Simon's lack of love shows that he's received little forgiveness. He recognises the woman as a sinner, but he fails to recognise his own sin and need for forgiveness. Yet Jesus' parable makes Simon's need of forgiveness equally clear. Both the characters were in debt. One may have owed 500 denarii and the other 50, but neither of them was able to pay. Whether you owe 50 days or 500 days salary, it makes no difference if you're both unable to pay. Both of these characters were completely dependent on the mercy and generosity of the moneylender. And you know, um, moneylenders aren't particularly known for their mercy and generosity. Sometimes in today's society, uh, it is possible to get agencies involved and to get um, debts cancelled. But, but uh, moneylenders are not going to be in a hurry to cancel your debts. This was, this was somebody who was, who was uh, very merciful and generous. They were completely dependent on him. And similarly, each one of us owes a debt of love and obedience to God, which we're completely unable to pay. We're totally dependent on the grace and mercy of God. There's a story told about Tsar Nicholas I of Russia. It's said that the Tsar was very interested in the welfare of a young man whose father had been one of the Tsar's friends. Nicholas gave the young man a fine position in the army, making him responsible for the finances of a particular division. The young man did quite well at first, but as time went on, he began to gamble. It wasn't long before he gambled his entire fortune away. He borrowed from the treasury, trying to win his money back, but he kept on losing and gambled that money away a few rubles at a time. Then one day he was told that there would be an audit of the books the next day. He went to the safe, took out the ledger, and discovered that he had an astronomical debt. As he sat at the table despairing, he took out his pen and wrote the, this phrase, a great debt, who can pay? Unwilling to face the shame of what would happen the next day, he took out his revolver and decided he would take his own life at the stroke of midnight. But as he sat at the table, he dozed off. Now apparently, Tsar Nicholas had a habit of putting on a soldier's uniform and visiting some of his outposts unannounced. On that very night, he visited the fortress. As he inspected it, he saw a light in one of the rooms. He knocked on the door, but no one answered. So he opened the door and went in. There was the young man, asleep. The Tsar recognised him immediately. When he saw the note on the table, a great debt, who can pay, and the ledger opened, his first impulse was to wake the young man up and arrest him. But then Tsar Nicholas was overwhelmed by a wave of generosity. Instead, he took the pen and wrote one word on the sheet of paper and quietly left the room. About an hour later, the young man woke up and reached for his revolver. But then he saw the note. A great debt, who can pay? And there was one more word added. Nicholas. The young man trusted the Tsar's word 
And sure enough, the debt was paid. And that's what God has done for each one of us. Each one of us is morally and spiritually bankrupt before a holy God. Even our righteous deeds are like filthy rags in his sight. There is nothing we can do to earn or win his approval. A great debt. Who can pay? But in Jesus there is forgiveness, undeserved mercy and a, and a whole new start. Of course, when debts are cancelled, someone always pays. If I write off your debts, then I'm taking the debts on myself. And the Bible tells us that in Jesus' death on the cross, God has written his own name against our debts. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. At the cross, Jesus took our debts and their penalty upon himself, and his righteousness is credited to our account. However desperate our sins, when we genuinely look to Jesus in repentance and faith, they are forgiven and we receive wonderful new life. But we should never forget the price that has been paid as Paul says, the life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2 verse 20. Or as one of our songs says, wonderful grace that gives what I don't deserve, pays me what Christ has earned, then lets me go free. Wonderful grace that gives me the time to change, washes away the stain that once covered me, and all that I have I lay at the feet of the wonderful Saviour who loves me. When we realise how much we have been forgiven and what a great price was paid for our forgiveness, then we will want to lay our whole lives before the Lord in gratitude. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. So we've seen a disgraceful visitor and an ungracious host. And then thirdly, we see a grace-filled saviour. This woman has been a flagrant sinner. And Jesus knows about her many sins. But as she turned to him, her life was transformed by grace. As Jesus goes on to tell her, your sins are forgiven. Jesus is the one in whom forgiveness is found. And yet, the other guests were scandalised. Who is this who even forgives sins, they asked. It was the right question to ask, if only they were asking in the right spirit. For Jesus is the Son of God who was able to forgive their sin if they only recognised their need. But it seems that their question arose more from shock and contempt. Once again, Jesus tells the woman that she may go in peace. Your faith has saved you. Simon and his friends trusted in their own righteousness. They failed to recognise their own need of forgiveness, and so they were forgiven little. I guess they thought that their good deeds outweighed their bad deeds. But that's not how it works. We can never earn our way into God's good books. But when we recognise the depth of our own sin, we can throw ourselves upon his mercy. And when we do so by faith, we receive God's righteousness and forgiveness given freely. Your faith has saved you, Jesus says. Do note, it's not her love that saves her. Rather, her love is the reflection that she has been forgiven. 
As 1 John 4, verse 19 says, we love because he first loved us. So it's not her love that saves her, but her love is the evidence of what has happened in her life. Your faith has saved you, says Jesus. Go in peace. Elsewhere, Paul makes it clear that we cannot be saved by works, but only by faith in Jesus Christ. As another of our songs says, Amazing love, oh what sacrifice, the Son of God given for me. My debt he pays, and my death he dies, that I might live, that I might live. Who is this who, for, who even forgives sins? It's a fundamental question. Ultimately, it's impossible to be neutral about Jesus. So I want to ask, where do we see ourselves in this story? Do we see ourselves as respectable, upright and religious like Simon, having no need of forgiveness? Or do we see ourselves in this woman, a sinner, condemned, unclean? but having found grace and forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Because the reality is there are two kinds of sinners here. A respectable and proud sinner and a repentant and forgiven sinner. I wonder which are you? It's very easy to come along to church and to be a middle class person, very good and respectable, and to think that I'm basically all right. You may think you're basically a good person. You haven't done any, anyone too much harm. You come along to church regularly. But the truth is that as long as we trust in our own righteousness, we can never receive the grace of God. There's an old story of a man dying and meeting St Peter at the gates of heaven who tells him, you just need a thousand points to come in. OK, that's easy, the man said. I've been a fairly good person all my life. I help old ladies across the road, that sort of thing. Very good, said Peter. That'll give you three points. <laughs> oh, said the man, a little crestfallen. Well, I've been to church all my life. I even taught Sunday school for a little while. Excellent, said Peter. That will be another three points. What? said the man. At this rate, I'll never get in apart from the grace of God. Grace of God, sir, said Peter. That'll do nicely. <laughs> the fact is that the self-righteous can never be saved. But when we recognise that we're sinners in need of mercy, Jesus is ready to welcome us with open arms. Whoever we are, whatever we've done, he extends the welcome of grace towards us if we will receive him. Put your trust in him today and you can hear his words. Your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And when we recognise the kindness and grace of God who accepts us at such measureless cost, we will want to love and serve him for the rest of our lives and for all eternity. In 1847, Sir James Simpson of Edinburgh discovered the use of chloroform as an anaesthetic in surgery. Some have claimed that this was the most significant discovery of modern medicine. In his later years, Sir James was lecturing at Edinburgh University and a student asked, what do you consider to be the most valuable discovery of your lifetime? So James answered quickly, my most valuable discovery was when I discovered myself a sinner and that Jesus Christ was my saviour. I could say that too, and I guess many of, many of us can, can say that. My most valuable discovery was when I discovered myself a sinner and that Jesus Christ was my saviour. That's grace. May we who have been forgiven much, love much, and rejoice in the new life 
that we've re received through Christ. If you, if you have never recognised that you are a sinner standing before a holy God, may you recognise it now. But the good news is that there is grace in Jesus Christ. We can, we can reach out to him in faith and he's promised to receive us because, of, because he's paid our debt at the cross. We can, we can turn to Jesus Christ and know eternal life and forgiveness. That precious gift which is greater than, than anything else that we could experience. And if we've given our lives to Jesus Christ, may the Lord keep us from having pharisaical attitudes, from... from trusting in our own righteousness, but seeing ourselves as respectable, um, as looking down on others. May the Lord help us to remember that we are nothing but sinners saved by grace. May we respond with great love. This woman loved much because she was forgiven much. And we also are called to respond to the grace of God by living a life of love because of the wonderful love of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, I just pray for anyone who has been challenged by this story. Lord, if there is somebody who has never experienced your wonderful grace, Lord, I pray that you would open their heart and their mind right now. Help them, Lord, to humble themselves and just respond to your wonderful grace, to receive your love and your forgiveness that you bought at such measureless cost. And for all of us, Lord, help us to recognise your amazing grace and to live our lives out of gratitude and love for you. In Jesus' name, Amen.